Madam Vice Chancellor, Professor Buleng Linkabula, Professor Muloko Sepota, the Regional Director of the Northeastern Region of UNISA, our distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, all our students joining us tonight, good evening and welcome to the 12th Eskia Mpatlele Memorial Lecture. This is the 12th year that we as UNISA host the annual Eskia Mpatlele Annual Memorial Lecture. The aim of this lecture is to honor the legacy of late Professor Eski Mpatlele and to acknowledge his contributions to literary discourse and to social development. Furthermore, as an institution, we hope that this platform will contribute towards advancing our social impact through teaching and learning, community engagement, and critical research. We are therefore very delighted to be hosting this year's lecture, which, like all the previous lectures, is based on our overall theme, the African writer as a prophet of social critic in contemporary times. Our topic for the 2021 lecture is the responsibility of the African scholar in a season of enemy hearkening to the voice of Eskiam Pasele. I'm sure you will agree with me, ladies and gentlemen, that indeed we need to have critical conversations about our ethical standards and moral values. And drawing from legacies of scholars such as Ndade Eskiam Pasele, who has been celebrated as the father of African humanism is necessary for our reflections. And once again, welcome to everybody. And now it is my privilege to invite Professor Moloko Sepota, the Regional Director of the Northeastern Region, to come and offer us introductory remarks. Professor Sepota. Thank you, Madam Project, Program Director, Professor Bulian Sekhalo. I would also like to greet our Vice Chancellor and Principal, Professor Pulian Lengabula. <laughs> <laughs> Prof, I think uh, congratulations are still in order. Congratulations once more, Prof. We are honored to be here today with all our participants and presenters albeit visually, at this 12th Memorial Lecture. This is the second of the 12 lectures to be hosted online. Madam VC, we are grateful that uh, you went out of your way to make this auspicious event possible. I'm aware, Madam VC, that we bothered you, we called you even at night regarding this issue with our debates starting as early as April when we met in Mbombela. And uh, we are grateful, Madam VC, that uh, you still managed to squeeze us in your hectic schedule for this week. We also wish to thank Professor Manja Makanya, our former VC, for his resolute support throughout his term. There were many challenges, and at some stage, I remember, there were those that were pushing that we should do away with this lecture, but uh, Professor Makanya put his foot down and supported us throughout. And that ensured that the lecture grew to be the giant it is today. We also discussed, as I indicated earlier on, at length with our current Vice Chancellor and Principal, Professor Lengabula. And already Professor Lengabula promised us her support. And we are 100% sure that uh, she knows what she's talking about. 
Professor Lengabula is one of those few discussants who participated in this platform. I think that was during the fourth annual lecture when we were at the ranch. And uh, all those that were there, even today, they will still tell you about Professor Lengabula because of her performance on that night. <clears throat> we are sure that under her leadership, this lecture will still continue to grow from strength to strength. We are not yet there, and we hope we will still go higher than that. Esteemed guest, uh, Professor Lengabula will be coming here as the VC very soon to welcome us all. Don't be surprised why I am not welcoming you. And uh, I want to assure you that next year, I'm not going to spoil the surprise now, but uh, believe you me, come next year during the 13th lecture, there's going to be a surprise, and you'll see it there. Esteemed guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, icons are worthy of being honored and celebrated. We are here tonight as our program director, Professor Sahalo, said, we are here to celebrate one icon, Eskiam Patele. Mokharawa Makuvela, Motuabole Peke Peke Le Padimisha Chosha. We are here to honor that icon. The icon who touched so many lives, not only in South Africa, not only on the continent, but globally. We are grateful to have him as son of the soil. The man who is attached by birth to Limpopo province. That is why it is befitting that we as people from Limpopo must come all out and honor and show our respect to this icon. This event, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, esteemed guests, is an attempt to keep his spirit long, long after alive after his departure. This is an attempt not only to celebrate his legacy, but also to honor the values and principles that he espoused, the values that could be linked very well with his life and in line of thought on social justice. This is the giant who refused to suffer in silence. Describing him at our memorial lecture in 2019, Ruel Kosa said, he is a symbol of South African resilience and a custodian of time-tested wisdom. Our guest speaker today is going to address us as our program director indicated on the topic, the responsibility of African scholar in a season of anime, hearkening to the voices of Eskiam Patlele. This, Madam Program Director, I believe you'll agree with me, it's an apt topic at this point in time. The chronic challenges some of which seem to have been legitimized, put demands on us all to listen to the words of wisdom from Eskiam Patlele. Not only words of wisdom, but also to take example from his life. This is the man who lived it and remained a true example of Ubuntu throughout his life. The year 2021 is not in any way different from last year. We continue to experience hardships and sorrow from every corner of life. We continue to experience uncertainties as COVID-19 continues to wreak havoc amongst us. As if this is not enough, some of us have seen an opportunity to cause even more damage by capitalizing on the ignorance and non-suspecting colleagues and community out there. 
Our lives are currently characterized mainly by one thing, that is loss. Loss of life, loss of income, loss of an opportunity for our students to sit down in class and study, loss of respect, loss of hope, but above all, loss of pride and dignity. When one looks around, one realizes that there are numerous challenges afflicting our society. Common challenges such as poverty, unemployment, gender-based violence, the list goes on. This lecture comes at a time, it comes when we are hearing, just against the backdrop, let me put it this way, of ruthless killings. We think here of people like Nosikelo Ndebeni, Samantha Zungu, Ndivuo Munyai, and many others out there. It is for this reason, ladies and gentlemen, that Mpatele's life and work become useful as his philosophy was that we should always first find out the causes of such human sufferings. Regarding education, he was very clear and he believed and we all believe that it is through education that we can be able to solve some of these challenges. But Mpatele aversed that our education system lacks some features to prepare learners for life. He argues that our education system says nothing about the world the school child returns to after school. He further argues that self-discovery is one feature that is conspicuously absent from the current education system. I believe this view dovetails very well with our VC and principal's line of thought. In her inaugural speech, she touched on that. And those that have been listening to her throughout know that this is something that is very much close to her heart. She indicated the need for an African knowledge system rather than mimicking foreign knowledge systems. Madam VC, if I could be allowed to use the biblical language, I would say you keep on asking us one question, which is how could you sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? And I hope we will know that uh, if we are to sing the Lord's song, we have to revisit our curricula. It is through events like this, when as an African university shaping features in the service of humanity, we try to create space for intellectual debates around Patel's life. Lessons one can draw from his values and to ensure that the seat he sue is in the short. We believe such debates will also contribute towards the academic project, but mainly we believe it will transform the nation. It would be prudent tonight to listen to Patel's voices as the guest speaker will be addressing out, and of course, also throughout the discussions. Let us stand up, embrace Mpatele's values, follow in his footsteps, and refuse to be silent. Mpatele's life signals that he would have expected universities as custodian of knowledge production, production to give direction during this time. Steve Bigo, who I believe was greatly influenced by Mpatele's idea of African humanism, gives us an advice as to what to do. He says, the first step, therefore, is to make the black man come to, to himself, to pump back life into his empty shell, to infuse in him with pride and dignity, 
to remind him of his complicity in the crime of allowing himself to be misused and therefore letting evil reign supreme in the country of his birth. I believe, ladies and gentlemen, this dovetails very well with what Professor Maluleke said this morning when he said, we are part of the problem and we have been part of the problem. So let us stand up as Biko is saying. Whilst I take pleasure in welcoming you all, guests, ladies and gentlemen, our VC will do a perfect job shortly after me now. Let Mpatelis Ligas live on, and I thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Sabota. And apologies that there are so many pullings on the program. Um, and, and perhaps that also gives me an opportunity to say which Puleng this one is. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am Puleng Sakhalo, the Chief Albert Lutuli Research Chair here at UNISA. And Prof. Sipota, thank you very much for reminding us of the importance of the work of Ndadem Patlele and what he stood for. Indeed, he was the icon who touched many lives. We are here to honor him. We are here to honor what he stood for, the man who stood for social justice, who fought for social justice through his work, through the work that he did. And you mentioned a very important point of the multiple losses that we are facing, that we're experiencing as a, as a people, as a society. And us reflecting and thinking about those who came before us and their legacies can perhaps assist us to think about ways in which we can respond to such challenges that we are confronting as a people. Indeed, Ndade Mpalele was very passionate about education, but not just education for the sake of education, but a relevant education that draws from our lived experiences. And I believe that this is where the decolonized, African-centered education becomes very, very important. And I think this is something that I cannot say enough. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we move over to Ms. Tsekhofato Monama, who is a member of Limpopo Artists. She's going to be joining us uh, remotely, and she's going to be offering us a poem. So I hand over to Ms. Tsekhofato. Shate! Yo, asarin shate, waduma. Uduma jawu yunisa kiraye na komanga na mareti university. Ubeleri mi huta yoshe roshe ya di ruderi. Um khashela gore ga o nyantshe ka Afrika fela. Wena le tswele ke le le telele telele la go shisha. Le fitla gohle le fase tjikelele. O ba nyantshe je mi ngwaga ye le kgolo masume ne shupa o ifepa. Ga o tshofale ke gona o ija bogale. My Tamorello was shushukile or Totoma Catsevo. Ovala little the holo jatuto yamonabo le fasig. Unyan chije barale bonaka eskia mpache. Unyan chije with Doctor Sean Ray Janssen from Rensburg. A only fiera like Robin Island Uzeni. O amusha wa pele mo presidente wa musho wa tokologo wa Afrika borwa. Khatologai ke yo o ishokago. Ba bona la le ba swara tipa ka bogale. O leje mo gale ya di mo professor a puleng leng ka bula. Ba nyanje ba le kheba ba le khaphela thoko. Mamusha uri wonchi je mutlolo wena yunisa Mamusha ti chaba ti makeji ka wena yunisa Mamusha u dirile her story wena yunisa u bonchi je di chaba gore ga di sawela ka maopeng Mamusha ditsile ke ma ready ready 
No more mob. Jets had it to fit a catelelo. Jets had it to fit a cacujo. Hey, Sima Garuri. Roya University, a matomo, Yamusad. Harimakal. Yo, kiss a garante. Yo, kit hagad. Kaniti musadi kichwini uliwa mabo. Baila matoho yofs. Baila matoho vets. Basai muna basai tatu aminoana. Rehokwele kwi 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 I am because we are. Jwela pili upadimishe yunisa. Jwela pili yunisa upadimishe lefasi. Jwela pili kama tutu ade aga mabiyoko. Jwela pili yunisa limbopo kabutaha. Jwela pili kasurupo jo samurali yo. Jwela pili hujweja sechaba pili kachwelo pili. Jwela pili uye pili beke li beke. Repilele use are ulimu belo ke lefasi. Uena University ya Afrika Wurwa. Are yo sarin shati wadu makere. A ratso hofato ara. Unisa, time for her story. Ladies and gentlemen, I cannot think of a better way to welcome and introduce our Vice Chancellor and Principal, Professor Buleng Linkabula, who will come and give us the official welcome address and also to introduce our guest speaker for tonight, Professor Lenka Bule. We are on the short side. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Puleng Sikhalo. I always teased uh, Professor Sikhalo because uh, people would often confuse us. And I used to tell her that uh, you should tell them that uh, you're the one we close the door when we have lunch against. They'll know that we didn't give you a little bit more food. And I'm the one who's a little bit flourished so we understand the metaphor, if you didn't know the distinction. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Saputa, for making us uh, explain that differentiation, because even elsewhere, this question has been asked many a times. His Excellency, Dr. Tabombeki, the Chancellor of the University of South Africa, and Ma'am Zanelembeki. The chairperson of the University of South Africa Council, Mr. Mashukuru Mabua, and council members present in this event, virtually or in person. Ms. Togo Didiza, Minister in the Department of Agriculture, Land Reform, and Rural Development that the university has a great relationship with, given her assistance in is instituting Achi Mafeje Research Institute at the University of South Africa, which has to be alive. Professor Adibayo Olokoshi, Director for Africa and West Asia International Idea, and our keynote speaker for tonight, one whose illustrious journey in Knowledge Arena, including having led the Council for the Development of Social Sciences Research in Africa. Your Excellencies, Ambassadors, High Commissioners representing various countries to South Africa.
Professor Mutata, the University Registrar, and members of Executive Management of UNISA, Professor Nzovu, Mr. Ramukumba, Professor Meiwa, Professor Veronica McKay, Dr. Mohobu, and Professor Mamba. Members of University Management, uh, Executive Deans of Colleges, Professor Sipota, the Regional Director of the Northeastern Region, and all staff members and leadership of our student formations in the region. Representative from various institutions of higher learning, members of the panel and discussants amongst us, but also those who are on virtual platforms. Professor Grace Huno, Acting Director, UNISA Department of Institutional Advancement, but also responsible for the scholarly aspects of transformation at UNISA. Professor Spamanda Zondi, who has been one of those colleagues that we have traversed uh, many uh, journeys with, who's currently at the Department of Politics and International Relations at the University of Johannesburg. Ms. Nombule Loshange, she's a lecturer at the University of the Free State and one of the young lecturers that you must be looking toward. Uh, when we see talent, we must oftentimes ensure that we create opportunities to projecting talent so that we are not just a university that affirms those who are established scholars, but give voice and evidence to this idea of shaping futures, even when such futures do not reside at UNISA. All I invited guests, both national and international, viewing this lecture virtually, members of the UNISA community, both staff and students, all university stakeholders, internal, external, and our own society, whose contributions, whether through the taxes, the prayers, the insights, and the aspirations for UNISA, to being the African University shaping futures. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guest Dumelang. Dumelang. Tavela. Thank you. I count it as a great honor to be part of this evening's event. It marks the 12th year since Ndate Eskiam Patlele departed from Earth. Ndate Patlele had the most interesting life, and we are very fortunate that he captured so much of it in his two autobiographies and many outputs, mentors, mentees, and his voice that keeps rever reverberating in our ears, but in our hearts. In 1957, the year he went into what turned out to be a 20-year exile, Professor Mpatlele earned his master's in literature from the University of South Africa, and thus is one of our illustrious alumnus. So as we celebrate him today, knowing that we share the standing, is standing as a writer with the world, we at Tunisia are also doubly proud knowing that he was an alumnus of our university. His voice was gentle, his views sharp, his hair white, and his eyes filled with the kindness of one born to teach the world the wonders of humane wisdom, knowledge, and being. In our quest for and commitment to centering Africa's knowledge systems in our teaching, learning, and research projects, Eskia's change of name from the given Ezekiel to his chosen Eskia was a way of centering and affirming his African identity, but also of ensuring where there is received wisdom, 
moral agency or choice to determining the future becomes an integral part of reweaving our identities in the most constructive ways. He dwelt mightily with the proponents of negritude philosophy who felt paid only cursory attention to their inner life. More needs to be done to study the writing of Eskiam Patele. In the 12 years after his death, his voice has receded into somewhat muted voice and we don't want it to recede to obscurity. He was a fully engaged scholar, a creative writer, a literary icon, an activist that many scholars and literary activists look up to. His travels across both Southern and Western Africa, the United States, added complexity to his life. His is a voice that needs our attention even more. Whilst we may have as a university this lecture to commemorate his life, as well as the Sunnyside campus, where we have in memory for posterity a building for learning, celebrating this iconic son of South Africa and of Limpopo, that we should continue to ensuring that his works are not forgotten. I also want to thank uh, Professor Rocky Ralibipi Sumela, the director of the region, Professor Sipota, who actually agitated and worked hard for this lecture to be a grand academic calendar event, but also a South African event for the University of South Africa, who has currently been appointed as a member of council of the University of South Africa. And those, the genesis of this celebratory lecture is also important to mark in historicizing the contribution of intellectuals and women academics within UNISA whose initiatives sometimes fall through the cracks and are not documented. And I celebrate the fact that you, as the regional director in Lipopo, has found it important and imperative to continue in rebuilding and ensuring that this particular and important lecture continues. Thank you, Professor Siputa. That Professor Mpatele was banned as a teacher from South Africa as a result of challenge in the coming into effect of Bantu Education Act should remind us all that ideas have always been sites of contestation of liberation and of dignity. It should also remind us that education is a revolutionary act not just something that we do to get jobs. Those of us who wish to imagine and bring into being different, more, more, a more just world should begin by educating the next generation to pick the baton that Professor Mpatele left for them in these writings, but also in his poems. We hold this annual Eski Patele Memorial Lecture because we hold it as truth that the memory of Professor Patele is worth preserving and his life and work are worth celebrating, drawing on, and continuing to propelling us as a university to thinking with him in imagining our futures. He's not only known for his scintillating autobiography, Down Second Avenue, which I was introduced to by my literature professor, Zeik Smda. It was first published in 1959, but constantly 
has been republished. He added literary criticism, poetry, scholarly writing, and fiction to his body of work. His writings include The African Image, which he wrote in 1962, Voices in the Whirlwind, and other essays, the novel, The Wanderers, Chirundu, Father Come Home, and others. And these are symptomatic, but also capture the historical contestations and meaning making of life during his lifetime. Mbatele's story is one of the many of a man of the letters. It is also a story of a writer forced into exile. It is equally the story of a teacher banished from the vocation he loved because of apartheid, a very, very critical and unkind system. It is also a story of a humanist who fell deeply in love and shared a life with his wife, friend, and companion, Rebecca Mpatele, from their marriage in 1945 to her death in 2004. Something that's quite important because apartheid had decimated families. And to have a family that was able to navigate and to become resilient is something that we need not take for granted. Those of us who come from families where sometimes fathers are not available to being partners in nurturing families can attest to why the book Father Come Home might be resonant. An apartheid system made the fathers the absent participants in the livelihoods of society. As Mbatele says in his book, we stood by each other through the years when the news of apartheid around the African communities in South Africa was beginning to tighten. We stood by each other during the years of ex exile in African countries, some of them resistant to foreigners, others extremely welcoming. We stood by each other during the years when we were studying to improve our academic standing at the University of Denver, Denver, US, at the same time raising the family and increasing it by two. I'm pleased to welcome Professor Adebayo Olokoshi, who will deliver this year's lecture titled The African Writer as a Prophet and Social Critique in Contemporary Times. Professor Olikoshi is a director for African West Asia International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance and was a member of the African Union Assessment Panel and chair of the board of several think tanks, but created a number one think tank, or at least propelled one to becoming number one think tank in the world, but also in the continent. What's important is that this time is not a literary scholar that's going to engage the works of our icon, a literary icon, a poet, a novelist, a storyteller, and an intellectual. It's a developmental economist. It's one who has constantly reminded us that Africa is not monolithic, is diverse, brings multiplicities of talents, civilizations, knowledge systems, but also that we shouldn't this morning, he said, waste our time sometimes with the nonsense that is used to undermining the humanity, dignity, intellect of Africans, but to invest our energies in co-constructing lives, well-being, and success. We're privileged, therefore, to come and listen to this prominent academic a pan-Africanist to deliver this year's lecture. And as we welcome him, I thought it would be apt for us to read one of the poems of Professor Mpatele. What is there that we can do or say will sustain them in those islands 
where the son was made for the janitors. What is there that we can say or do will tear the years from the hands of those who men the island galleries will bring them home, dry and mend them, bring them back to celebrate with us the song and dance in the toil of living. What is it that we must do or say for children scattered far from home by hawks let loose to stay in the judgment day? The weeds run riot where our house is fallen. Ourselves we roam the wilderness. Go tell them there across the seas. Go tell them. So they say his mother's dead six years, he dare not come. He dare not write. The stars themselves have their eyes and ears these days. You who fell before the cannon or the sabred tooth, or lie on the hallowed ground, oh, tell us what to say or do. So many roots have led exile since your day, our elders, we've been here and back in many cycles, oh, so many. No terrain different, dramas borrowed dreams, and there behind us now, the hounds have diamond fangs and paws still. No time for dirge or burial without corpses. Teach us, elders, how to wait and fill the center. Tame the time like master sings, sing the blues. So pain will bleed in the, and let the island in, for exile is a ghetto of the mind. I thought this poem spoke to the idea of contextually reflecting on the lives, structural systems that we live in, whether in the economy, ecology, in our minds, in aesthetics, and in our thinking futures. And I thank you for listening and open this event and lecture as an important marker for the University of South Africa in the context of COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Vice-Chancellor, Professor Buleng Linkabula, for your welcome address, always insightful, always forcing us to, to think and to think deeply and to reflect about the various aspects of our lives, about the role that we play, not only in the academia, but in the world more broadly. Thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor now to welcome Professor Adebayo Olukushi, our keynote speaker for tonight, to deliver his keynote address. Professor Olukushi, over to you. And please, Prof, remember to switch on your video and to unmute yourself. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Director of Programs, and uh, a very uh, warm good evening uh, to all of the invited guests, uh, participants um, across uh, South Africa and uh, connected virtually. Um, and let me um, say how very honored and delighted uh, I am to uh, have been invited to say a few words uh, on the occasion of the 12th uh, lecture in the series uh, to honor the memory uh, of um, a renowned uh, son of Africa, um, a child of the continent, uh, S.K. Mpadlele, uh, whose influence and impact, as we have heard already, um, went beyond uh, the shores of South Africa um, to uh, other parts of the continent and indeed uh, around the world. Um, I feel uh, particularly honored to uh, be uh, speaking today, um, in part because uh, it enabled me to 
uh, go down uh, memory lane uh, and remind myself uh, of some of the uh, foundational um, uh, experiences, uh, which I, along with many others, uh, in my generation of students uh, at the Amadou Bello University in Zaria, uh, enjoyed uh, in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, um, studying what we uh, uh, would categorize as social science disciplines, uh, but also being fully immersed uh, in uh, the humanities, uh, practically seeing little or no boundaries uh, between them. Um, and that background, I think, also gave me the courage uh, to accept the invitation which uh, the Vice Chancellor extended to me uh, to uh, deliver this lecture. Uh, because indeed, as she, she has noted, um, uh, this is probably the first uh, time that a non-core literary uh, scholar or figure uh, will be speaking on the occasion of this lecture. Um, I am comforted by the fact that my first encounter with the intellectual titan and activist Eskia Mpandele before he replaced Ezekiel with Eskia was as an undergraduate student in my early teens at Amadou Bello University in the geographical north of Nigeria. It was a period of intense intellectual, political, and civic activism among Nigerian scholars and students and the campus of Ahmadu Bello University, as most other campuses of Nigerian universities, and indeed even as well as universities further afield, like the University of Ghana at Legon, Furabe College in Sierra Leone, Makerere in Uganda, Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, and the University of Liberia in Monrovia, were abuzz with lively discussions and debates about the direction of post-colonial Africa and the role of the university community in helping to shape that future. As a student in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, I had the privilege, like many of my peers, of being inserted into a flourishing milieu of scholarship that was, that was anchored on a self-confident assertion of the African identity and an equally self-assured convic conviction that we had a world before us to mold and to shape in the best interests of our continent and humanity. That milieu was itself a truly Pan-African one, counting in its ranks accomplished African academic activists from across the entire continent and its diaspora who worked assiduously alongside their Nigerian counterparts to try to reclaim the past of the continent, play a fulsome role in reshaping its present, in shaping its present, and be the key drivers, among the key drivers in defining its future. Of the many scholars from across Africa and, that, and the diaspora who animated the Zaria School and the broader Nigerian and West African terrain, either as established staff members or visiting academics were a contingent of South Africans, such as Sam Norushungu at Ibadan, Lewis Nkosi, who set anchor at JOS, Mbulelo Nzimani, who taught me some literature at Amadou Bello University and was a moving spirit of the workshop theater at the university, Jabulo Ndebele, was later to also be at the University of Jos, and of course, Eskia Mpatlele, whom I did not have the opportunity and the privilege to meet in person, uh, but who was himself also at a point based at Ibadan and became a consummate part of that premier university, uh, participating alongside his colleagues in shaping the teaching of literature uh, and the arts uh, in, uh, in that context. This was the context, therefore, this was the background of my encounter with the writings of Mpatlele, beginning with his poetic reflections, which were taught to us as undergraduates, actually first year undergraduates, alongside the writings of Peter Abrahams, Kantemba, 
Dennis Brutus, uh, to cite a few of the Latin names which we took in the literature class. One impartially poem that especially stood out for me at that time was the one he penned, and which is probably not very popular amongst those of his writings that are celebrated, but which is titled Stanislas the Renegade. It was included in an anthology of African contemporary poetry that was compiled by Walesho Inca and the theme of the renegade behavior, which in part lately addressed frontally in the poem, is one which I thought resonates very much with me in what I have chosen to describe for this lecture as the season of anomie that our continent is going through, because it is a season which is also suffused with a lot of renegade behavior, both within the context of leadership, but also in the discontents of citizenship. What does this season of anomie comprise of? To answer this question, a very short excursion into our recent history will be appropriate. And I, I hope that you will indulge me in taking that excursion as much for the reason that that history was integral to the making of Mpatletle as for the fact that it is germane to our understanding of where we find ourselves today. And my starting point, very convenient starting point, in briefly charting this history is the period from after 1945, when the African continent was in the grip of a growing nationalist fervor for self-determination and independence, whose key champions are very well known uh, and do not bear recounting here. That was a period which promised a new beginning for the continent against a backdrop of centuries of dehumanization and domination enacted through the slave trade, the so-called legitimate trade, and the colonial imposition. To their credit, and against a neoliberal revisionism, the pioneers of the African independence struggle did invest themselves with some vigor in making that new beginning possible once independence began to be won from 1956-57 onwards. From the task of state building and nation building to the business of social and economic transformation, they invested themselves in a work of reconstruction and renewal designed to retrieve the humanity and dignity of the African whilst taking a claim at the table in the Committee of Nations around the world. And many of them were relatively young. Kwame Nkrumah, Julius Nyerere, Kenneth Kaunda, even Seda Senghor, and many others who championed the African independence struggle and sacrificed and invested themselves in a work of remaking the post-colonial economy and society regardless of the degree of their success or failure, the commitment which they displayed, I think, was not one which could be doubted. And nowhere more so than in the example that was shown by the likes of Julius Nyerere and the bold measures which he took in the direction of nation building that saw the adoption, for example, of Swahili as the national language in place of English, and, and a social engineering that was named Ujama, around which he sought to re-energize economy and society towards a greater productivity while sustaining solidarity. Now, let us be sure about it. The efforts that were deployed by the pioneers of the African independence project in their quest for a continental rebirth were not without their discontents just as they were also, and this is sometimes underestimated, just as they were also the targets of neo-colonial subversion and sabotage, including assassinations or plots of assassinations, of mercenary action, and of fifth columnist coup d'etats. The case of the DRC, the Congo at independence, and the fate of Lumumba is probably the best known example of this. But no country that gained independence 
and tried to assert its autonomy on the continent was paired all of these conspiracies designed to derail the independence project. Nevertheless, the revisionist narrative of the 1990s, championed by the international financial institutions, that the first three decades of independence were wasted years was little more than a self-serving piece of propaganda, which in fact and theory does not stand scrutiny, and also discounts the many new imperial and Cold War era interventions that were cons consciously crafted to derail the African independence project. The period of hope towards a continental renew renewal which independence brought was followed at the beginning of the 1980s by the onset of what, put in a historical perspective, will qualify to be described as the deepest and longest running economic crisis which Africa has known until, uh, uh, until now. That crisis provided a context and pretext for a massive international intervention in the domestic policy making processes of most African countries by multilateral and bilateral donors. By all accounts, the range and the breadth of the intervention that took place were unprecedented, were of an unprecedented kind in the, when put in the context of the demise of direct colonial rule. And they played out as an almost complete hijack of the key levers of domestic decision making in order to facilitate the imposition of neoliberal structural adjustment programs marketed as the so-called Washington Consensus. A vice president of the World Bank, senior vice president of the World Bank in the 1990s was in fact to take a sweep across the African continent and to remark that there were in fact many more development policy advisors seconded by the multilateral institutions and bilateral donors active in different African countries than there were colonial officials throughout the period of the colonial encounter. To give us a sense of the massive investment which was made in the context of the crisis of the 1980s and 90s to effectively take over the levers of the decision making uh, in Africa and to confer this on external so-called agencies of restraint who basically defined what the priorities of African countries should be. Although structural adjustment was packaged as a program that was de designed to stem the economic crisis into which the continent had been plunged, its deflationary anti-state and unbridled free market thrust meant that it itself became part and parcel of the dynamic of the crisis which it was purportedly designed to solve. More than that, it actually worsened the context of African socioeconomic management and political governance and plunged the continent as a whole into a state of prolonged stagnation and decline. On account of this, many African scholars were to point out that the structural adjustment years in Africa were actually the real wasted years of the post-colonial period, not least because the programs diverted African countries away from the business of development in a futile quest for a free market-based path of transformation that has had no precedent in world history. It was the peak of our first post-colonial season of anomie. Not surprisingly, the structural adjustment framework came against popular resistance, which culminated in mass and sustained demands for change that ushered Africa into a renewed era of multi-party politics from the 1990s onwards. That period also coincided with the onset of the demise of apartheid and what was left of the settler colonial experience on mainland Africa, beginning with the independence of Namibia and ending with the election of Nelson Mandela as the first president of a democratic South Africa. In many respects, it was another momentous period 
in the story of the post-colonial um, African experience, even if its fullness was marred by several ongoing conflicts, such as in Liberia and Sierra Leone, but also particularly the genocide that took place in Rwanda. With direct European colonial rule ended on mainland Africa, there were hopes once again that the continent had won itself another chance at rebuilding and renewing in order to win the future. The views were widely aired that having won the battle against colonialism, the so-called first liberation, Africa now needed to self-introspect and organize itself to win the second battle of liberation. For the first battle, the clarion call for its main thrust was given by Kwame Nkrumah himself in a rallying cry to Africans to seek ye first the political kingdom so that every other thing could be added unto us. For the second battle, there was some unanimity that Africa now needed to tackle on the development frontally and to do so through a collective con commitment to continental socioeconomic transformation. Amidst the numerous ideas that were shared across the continent to drive a new phase of renewal, one which quickly gained traction was the notion of building democratic developmental states, along with all of the implications associated with such a commission commitment. Commitments at the country level were to be accompanied by a revamping of continental institutions and processes with a notable focus on the transformation of the old organization of African unity into a new African Union. The AU, it was hoped, would embody the new spirit that was being forged of a dignified continent at peace with itself and with the world and committed to superintending an overall engagement between the continent and the world on the basis of dignity and self-respect. Above all, the AU was to be operated as a union of the peoples of Africa and not a mutual backslapping club of rulers. Many steps, both symbolic and substantive, were initiated to propel Africa to a new era in its history. The quartets of Buteflika, Tabo Mbeki, Olusegun Obasanjo, and Abdullahi Wad were to champion a new partnership for Africa's development as a mechanism for a coordinated engagement between the continent and the world based on priorities identified by Africa itself. The African Union as an institution was imbued for the first time with a doctrine of non-indifference that spoke to a desire by member states no longer to be silent in the face of egregious acts of misrule on the continent. An African peer review mechanism was also launched to allow for a voluntary submission by leaders and countries to peer critique. The new determination across Africa to get it right and forge ahead in confidence also spurred a fresh round of conversations about the imperative of continental unity and economic integration. Various competing proposals about the creation of one version or the other of a continental union government were tabled and spirit, spiritedly debated at different levels and fora. Much of the debate was reminiscent of some of the discussions at Manchester, at the Manchester Pan-African Conference of 1945 and the proposals tabled in the 1960s in the lead up to the founding of the OAU in 1963. It seems to me that the full spirit of the times was captured most eloquently and in many respects in a stirring way in Tabo Mbeki's famous I am an African speech and the rallying call for a continental renaissance which it conveyed. If Africa was not short of hope and an underlying vision about its future, there was still an important challenge which many of the countries of the continent still needed to grapple with. And this challenge centered on winning back sovereignty over the continent's policy direction, especially from a transnational power coalition that had maintained a grip on decision-making in too many countries. 
this situation created a major disjuncture between the aspirations underpinning the quest for a second liberation and a doctrinaire neoliberal orthodoxy championed by a powerful coalition that effectively constrains the capacity of governments on the continent to act. It was only a matter of time before hope, which had been sown, would begin to turn into anxiety and perhaps culminate in despair. The disjuncture between aspiration and lived reality that came to confront Africa as the new millennium began and progressed has been at the heart of the season we are undergoing. True, during the first decade of the new millennium, several African countries experienced growth episodes that led some international consultancy houses and Western media institutions to proclaim the rise of the African lion or cheetahs, offering mouth-watering returns on investment that far exceeded anything available in the mature economies of the world. Added to the big and still fast growing population of the continent, its overwhelmingly youth demographic profile and the high spending power of a minority middle class, the continent was presented to the world as the new beautiful bride. The problem though with the Africa rising narrative championed by global financial and media interests is the fact that it was predicated on a growth episode that was fueled largely by a commodity price boom whose benefits were not plowed back into the continent on a scale and in a manner that could help to drive the structural transformation for which Africans were yearning and which constituted the centerpiece of the effort at the continental renaissance. If anything, even as the boom was being celebrated, Africa's unhappy situation as a net exporter of capital to the rest of the world was, intensify was intensifying. And this was amply documented by the Mbeki report on illicit financial flows from Africa to the rest of the world. The capital which the continent has been hemorrhaging over the years since independence has in fact far outstripped has in fact far outstripped whatever it receives or has received in the form of aid and foreign investments. Although the popular narrative suggests the contrary to us. At the same time as being a net exporter of capital to the world, the domestic performance and prospects of most African countries are the stuff of a catastrophe in the making. A stagnant, largely undiversified and deindustrialized production base dependent on raw commodity exports and some external aid, unable to generate the incomes needed to run a decent state system and generate jobs for its citizens, especially the youth, is mostly what stares us in the face in most African countries. Massive and prolonged youth unemployment and underemployment have gone hand in hand with expanding boundaries of poverty and inequality that speak to the precariousness of social order, the viability of political regimes, and a growing culture of violence and criminality, including gender-based ones. For many of the people of the continent, especially the youth and the working poor, the overall outlook is not exactly one of hope. The impulse to disengage and to check out through legal and illegal migration is a very strong and present one in a generation of people who ordinarily should be the inheritors of a renaissance continent. With the post-colonial social contract all but destroyed, social cohesion has been frayed and states remain severely weakened and increasingly delegitimated. In many cases, states have also been in retreat or have come under siege in the face of trans-border extremist and criminal grounds of the kind which we recently saw in Mozambique, but which in fact has been the story of the Sahelian countries over a period running into almost two decades. In some parts of the continent, these gangs control territory 
and have established states within states. Narrow identity politics have also enjoyed a resurgence in many countries as ethnic irredentists have come to occupy a center stage in everyday life alongside a phalanx of priests and alchemists underwriting a new wave of religiosity. In the face of the myriad challenges facing the continent, leadership regrettably has been patently lacking at many different levels. Stories of corruption in high office are a regular part of the daily menu in too many of our countries, as to give the impression that those entrusted with the affairs of the Commonwealth do not even themselves believe in the countries they are supposedly leading. In the absence of a coherent vision, of a coherent vision and direction, African leaders are summoned by all and sundry to all manner of summits around the world that may boost the ego of a legitimacy hungry elite desperate for international validation, but does not bring concrete benefits to their country and their peoples. Against domestic voices of concern, local democratic spaces are being closed and the gains of the democratic transitions of the 1990s are being rolled back. It is an all round season of anomaly from which the majority are not immune. The season has been compound, compounded by the COVID pandemic, which in case there's still any doubt about the gravity and urgency of our situation has laid bare for all of us to see the full depth of our structural and conjunctural failings and weaknesses. And just in case there's still a residual expectation that the world might come to our rescue, the live experience of vaccine nationalism that we are witnessing should serve as a reminder, even a wake up call, that we must take our destiny into our hands in order to forge ahead. The world may humor us that we are an important part of the planet, but it has also shown us time and again and amidst a raging pandemic that no one actually owes Africa a living. And no one can be ambitious for us in our place. I characterize the period we are traversing as one of a gradual breakdown of political, economic, social, cultural, and moral ethical order, not for the sake of simply lamenting or even to validate perennial naysayers who see nothing good coming out of Africa. Rather, I table these issues as a call to duty and to arms to all of us that unless we organize, we risk losing our continental home yet again. And this time round, history will not be kind to us. To reboot ourselves and face the challenges before us, there is much which we can learn from the example of Eskia Mpatledli and his life of engaged activism built on a conviction that if we organize ourselves on a platform of justice, equity, and humanism, we can win back our world. For us as African scholars, the responsibility which the times impose is a fairly straightforward one when viewed from the lenses of Umpatlebli and his teachings. An invitation to be grounded, deeply connected to the land as to be inspired by it in the course of our efforts to imagine the future, rather than be that character in Stanislas the Vagabond, who basically acts in the, in the way and pattern of someone who is a renegade. Connectedness to the land and to our ancestors featured much in Mpatete's teaching as much for the inspiration as and insights which it yields as for the creativity and innovation it offers. It is another way of saying that as rooted scholars, we can and should with our own heads define solutions to the problems that rack us. I will not be telling this audience anything new. If I refer to the tough life experience of, that Mpatlele had as a child and a young adult, before, in the face of his fight against Bantu education, he was driven into exile. What is remarkable in his story of resilience and rejuvenation was the constant engagement with his immediate environment as a place and a site for organizing 
along with like-minded people for the kind of change that liberated the body, that liberates the body and the spirit and unleashes torrents of creativity. Largely self-taught and educated, he was a great believer in community and in insertion. You need a locale. You need its smell, its taste, its texture. And his observation that you are tied to the place that contains the experience. We have a clear on call to rediscover an organicity that liberates us from the shackles of received wisdom and invent knowledges that speak to our history, our needs, and our aspirations. This will necessarily mean that we take responsibility for our continent and do so with the full confidence that as partakers in the triumphs and travels of our people, we have a duty to engage fulsomely and without apology, learning, teaching, proposing, critiquing, and rebuking as the context demands. For all his travels, Mpatlete never disengaged. There is a lesson in that. Mpatlete, for all the dangers and terrors he faced, never succumbed. There is also another lesson in that for us. Mpatlete, for all the knowledge he acquired, never forgot ancestry and community. There is an instruction in that as well. And Mpatlete, at all times, saw himself as an unapologetic change agent who did not hesitate to speak truth to power, not for the sake of any vainglory, but the, for, the, for the collective good. There's a lesson as well to take home in that. And for those amongst us who might be tempted to uproot ourselves from the demands of our context, it may be worth remembering that Eskia and Patletle was that header boy who from Marabastad through Soweto and Sophia Town and with the groundings he had with the ordinary people eking out a living in the slum of Bariga in Nigeria, emerged into a global person of letters, celebrated for the fact that he remained true to his roots. Truth to our roots is a constant refrain in the voices of Umpatlete in all of his writings. It is one which I commend to us in this season of Anomi. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you indeed, Professor Olukushi. Thank you for highlighting the complexities of the post-colonial African experience. Thank you mostly for the historical excavation that you've provided us today, the importance of looking back, the importance of knowing history, so that we can be able to truly understand the challenges that are confronting us today as the African continent. Listening to your talk, I was reminded of uh, Professor Sepota's insights earlier when he was talking about the many losses that we're experiencing as a people, but also the vice chancellors also note on the role that colonialism and apartheid played on the disintegration of the African family. And for me, these are linked to what you spoke about, Prof, on the centuries of dehumanization of the African people, the loss of dignity as a result of this dehumanization. As the African people being treated as subhuman also contributed to these losses and the despair that you speak of today, the despair as a result of these losses and the anxieties that many people continue to go through. So the structural failings and how these are contributing to the many ills that we find in our society and indeed, we have to take our destiny into our own hands. 
And I would like to invite you, ladies and gentlemen, as you were listening to Prof and thinking about comments that you would like to make and thinking about the questions that you have, I would like to invite you to please share your questions and your comments in our chat box and we will engage the Prof on these questions later on. And now before I call on our discussants to provide their reflections, I would like to invite Ms. Musivyadi Monama, who is a principal at Nwana Sehlakwana High School in Maraba Circuit in Limpopo Province. But it's also important to note, ladies and gentlemen, that Ms. Musivyadi Monama is the mother of Tsehofazo Monama, whose poem we heard earlier. And so, indeed, the intergenerational transfer of knowledge is coming to life through mother and daughter, as we will see them tonight. Indeed, And let's now hear what it is that she has sucked from her mother's breast. Over to you, Me. Era wa ke na Ezekiel mphahlele na ke mo Africa ka se Africa ke Eskia ba o ba nthatha go ba mbija ziki ke manga ke se morwa wa Moses le Efa ke ra mmage ngwana se swara thipa ka go galeng a nghatlela go ya go tše ka o ne dikolo a ghethologa nye mathushetse a re ae o nagalela morao ba sa tsebe gore ye ke ngaka ya go sasa o rang go gore go se dupe ga ke di gore o se tse ka moka ba re mogaga wa makubele ke ra mohlapi wa di gomo le dipudi maupaneng ke ra maupaneng ga mphahlela gae le mpopo bogoni khotlelelo le matla di jotse ke metheo sha mebotu di thabeng tsa shebetswa ke khudisho chip ya magolo montedi Mammelere a a go jama kholo mondedi a re ga mo motho jona ke libile dingong ja pitlagalo ya mibila ya mishoro marabi na ga o mpona ke libelo ke a peilo potonje kholo sebe shong sa magala mo khweli ri chipi a re khwebi na ke murutishi mongwadi ra bogaba kalana e wetse tshwane ke ra maraba start moya o tjile gae a mahlaku le bo a go Saint Peter's ke go rulela kefa wa ntuta o ithuta ke gone thuto ya bonabo ka inomoro ka wena ke nameletse ka fitla kwa ntlhorwaneng se o se ngoroshitse maemong a bongaka bongaka ka go hlohlora ka dihlora ke gora gora skolong se se phagamego sa Orlando Wela khonetsi ya Adams o ntirile murutishi ka gae Unisa ka topa topa B8 degree mawele le degree ya honors ka gae Unisa na di thuto ga ke segele tsona monna ke a di thuntsha ka hlakana le MA ya di gatisho ka i rutela ba bantsi ka i rtu tu ya re fase shitla Unisa ya tshoga Unisa ya tutumela e thama go bona MA ka di khora le ena di thuto ke le khlohlora ka di khora la khlohlorega mmm ke a di rata le tsona di anthata ruri nka go lebala bya mwana esenzele o ntlhatse tshe lihlo wa nthula ntsha le ngwetsi ya bo mma mogadi bo wa buti wa nthaka ntsha le matutu a thorana tsa ka tetharo wa mpha murutishi modirela le yago mwa ga sechaba ka petha se Africa sa Africa nna mo Africa ka tla tsa la bo la falala ka bo se ba ratlane bo Romani la ri psi ruri o bo hlale wena Rebecca nana mo tshadibane wa khetha se ba di se ngwadi se hlalifi ke ba lo go ba hlami ba mogatlo wa baso wa ANC e politiki e gona e tsela thuto pele go tshohle le rato le phuphuma go phaphushi borutelo e se go phaphushi ditaba ke tshabile gae ye masome pedi mengwaga o ra gatelelo 
banka mwegela bo Nigeria, France, bo Kenya, Zambia, le ba gwera. Niti re batho ka bona, niti ke batho ka rena. Na le pene re monwana le lenala. Re ba khotse re khotselane re ntshane sa inong. Ya ka pene e ya khothatsa, ya ka pene e ya lemosha. E fodisha a khetlologanyo mabadi le go hloka toka. Ya ka pene e mphilela tata go botho ba batho le ina. Wena bongaka ga se o tapolle botho le bo Afrika byaka. Ya ka pene e ngwadile go ita daudisho pelo ga bedi. Pene ya ka e ngwadile go feta masometare a di kanegelo kopana. Ya ka pene e retile tsa malwa tsa todi ya dinosi. Pene ya ka e thala thadile tsa pedi ditemana tiragatjo. Pene ya boleta wikobo botho ya khabologo le bo Afrika. E ka ba ke seo ke ditjwa go Dean of the African Letters. Awa, niti a senaka tsa go rweshwa. Ke kodumetse ke khatile ba maso ba mpone ke kodumete ke khatile ba disebe ba nkwele ka amoretjo diabo tsa mo ditshaba tshaba ka hlokolwa go Nobel Prize ka dikhatisho ka hlompiwa ka order of the palm ke mmusho wa mafora ka amoretja siabo sa World Economic Forum Crystal Buta tawo si chaba Mandela ba mpara ka Order of the Southern Cross. Kodumela mwe patuti rolenu rikile o teurel. Ke chaba miditi. Aga, 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 shate. Kirubo mama mona mashate. Whoo, African languages are beautiful. The learners of Sitlakwana High School are so lucky, ma, to have you as their principal. I can only but envy, indeed. Ralebo, ralebo, kudu kamat. And now, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to invite our first discussant, Professor Grace Kuno, Acting Director, UNISA Department of Institutional Advancement, to come and offer us her reflections. Uh, Principal Vice Chancellor, uh, all protocol are observed. Rikwile, uh, Riboni. We we also felt his truth. Mbelekwe. Ndatem uh, pasele was all striking. Kingwechi ya ya home. And my first encounter. Le, the reality that Ntatem Pasele, with all his knowledge, with all his stature, was when I walked past his house, a simple house for a giant of a man. Ntatem Pasele was not impressed. He was humble and simple, but from his simplicity, his ability to live with the community, he was able to contribute immensely. Requile, Riboni, we can feel his contribution in Belekwe. Professor um, Alikoshi spoke very well of uh, the contributions that Ntatem Pasele has made uh, for us to continue thinking in uh, our efforts to humanize what it means to be African, but also uh, in our efforts to shape our African intellectual futures. Uh, Professor Alokushi spoke around multiple um, issues 
that we experience in the continent, from youth unemployment to youth underemployment. He also spoke around issues around gender inequality and cultural violence. Most importantly, I think he also spoke about narrow identity politics. And I think the life and works of Ntatem Pasele are quite useful in thinking around how we can overcome the narrow identity politics that we find ourselves battling with as Africans. And one of the lessons that Ntatem Pasele teaches around being, our, being true to ourselves is how he lived his life. He did not choose to move from his community because he understood that context matters. He understood that for one to be able to speak with authority on an issue, for one to be able to speak with authority on the challenges that we have, one has to uh, engage, one has to immerse themselves in those challenges. And that is why he never left Libuak home. And that is why we can learn from him that it is not about being pompous, but it is about understanding the significance of simplicity, especially when you want to uh, impact those who live simply. You can't come, <laughs> I remember one of my students uh, was speaking around how to um, do interviews, how to immerse yourself in a community when you are doing interviews, and how to not uh, seem like you are laughing at the community's poverty and so forth. And he said that, um, you know, I was using my smartphone. So how is the smartphone <laughs> going to allow you to fit in? Mpatlele was unapologetically himself. He was an agent of change. He spoke back to power because he did not need the promises that capitalism puts forth. He was very clear that he does not want the envelope that will come under the table. And the ability to live simply allowed him to refuse the laws of the envelope under the table. So his teachings speak to multiple things, including corruption, including uh, filling our own pockets. As we grapple with the challenges around um, hopelessness of our, our youth, which um, Professor Alekushu also spoke to, we, 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 we can learn a lot from uh, this giant of a man. I am quite graceful, grateful that uh, Professor Alokushi was able to not only speak of uh, Ndatem Pasele um, as, a, as an individual, but also speak around how Ndatem Pasele belonged to a community of scholars who made quite significant in, uh, contributions, contributions that we are speaking about now and we will always be speaking about. And I'm also grateful to uh, the Limpopo region for continuing this legacy uh, lecture. I think it's quite significant in uh, the excavating work that uh, we are continuing to do that is significant for identifying who we are by looking back to those who have come before us. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Professor Huno. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to hand over to Ndate Sipaman Lazondi, who is the professor in the Department of Politics and International Relations at the University of Johannesburg. And Ndate Zondi is joining us virtually. And so we're going to cross over to him. Ndate Zondi, please remember to switch on your video and unmute yourself. Thank you.
Ndete Zundi, you are still muted. Kindly unmute yourself. We still cannot hear you. Okay, I think maybe we have a technical challenge. I'm not sure if Ndete uh, Zundi can hear me. Uh, okay, he can hear me, uh, but we cannot hear you. So um, I think perhaps as we try uh, to resolve that challenge with our technical team to see what the issue might be, uh, we will move on to our next discussant and then we will come back to Ndate Zondi. So now I would like to call Ms. Nombulelo Shange. I apologize, I'm sure now I'm catching you off guard. Uh, but uh, Ms. Nombulelo Shange, who is a sociology lecturer at the University of the Free State, to come and give us her reflections. Thank you. Good evening. Um, um, I'd like to observe all protocol and to um, greet everyone um, and to thank everyone for this opportunity, particularly UNISA and um, under the leadership of um, Vice Chancellor Prof. Buleng Likambula. Um, I'm very grateful for this opportunity today. Uh, when I was invited to be a part of these proceedings, I was very excited. Uh, for the opportunity um, to engage in a platform with senior esteemed colleagues on an equal level. Um, I was also grateful for the opportunity to have my views shared and reflected um, and heard especially in, within academia where opportunities like this are often not given to young black female scholars such as myself. Um, but if I'm, I have to be honest, I was most excited about the opportunity to reacquaint myself um, with the work of Prof. S.K. Mpahlele because um, one of my favorite things to do before um, the physical and financial limitations of lockdown uh, was to buy bunches of books, tons of books, and go on holiday to read them. Um, so I was grateful to at least be able to live out the smaller part of my hobby, which is to buy books and have myself um, sort of revisit the works that I engaged with maybe in my high school years, early university years. Um, so making the time to read the work was the difficult part. As we know, academia is very demanding. And currently I am knee deep in an ethnographic study, um, which I've been conducting all over the Western Cape with a group of traditional healers who call themselves mountain doctors. So most evenings coming back home late from picking herbs, from um, doing day-long hikes that would often end with rituals um, and interviews with people who have amazing stories to share. I would find myself um, dragging myself back home, reading that Dempasela's um, work, falling asleep with his books in my hand, and frantically waking up the next morning to try and find um, where I was the night before, where I fell asleep. Um, I know I'm not describing it in a way that sounds very nice or exciting, but I promise you it was. Um, I really enjoyed the experience, again, of like re-immersing myself into his way of thinking. Um, and I surprisingly had the energy for it as well, despite all that is currently happening in my life right now. Um, whilst I can attribute some of this energy to some of the more special herbs that the mountain doctors shared with me to help keep me going and healthy. Um, but I think part of the energy came from the fact that Ndatem Patela's writings are written so simply. Um, his short stories, for instance, um, transcend complex theoretic, 
th theories and present the reader to the lives of the people that he narrates in ways that we can relate to, in ways that we can all understand. Um, often in academia, we veil important uh, and sometimes life-saving knowledge in complex, heavy theoretical discourse. We store knowledge in inaccessible libraries and departments so that those who need the knowledge the most are the most alienated from it. Um, it is for this reason that I've appreciated the simplicity and the candor of his work. Um, and even though he writes in very educational ways, um, I would sometimes find myself laughing at some of the humorous ways in which he presents issues, including serious and very complicated issues. Um, I think knowingly or unknowingly, by doing this, he showed his commitment to the decolonial agenda, which unfortunately is often confined to the university space. Um, and in this way, the decolonial agenda ends up betraying its own goal. Um, and this is because it doesn't reach the masses, um, because decolonization can't happen in the university space alone. Um, the university does not exist in a vacuum to society. It is both impacted by society and it impacts society. Um, one of the stories that really stuck with me um, whilst re-immersing myself back into his work uh, was a story called Point of Identity in his book, um, in corner B, I think it stuck with me because of the identity issues that he, he, he he talks about and that have been reflected in today's lecture as well. Um, and I think these identity issues stuck with me because of my current research as well and the exploration of the lives of the mountain doctors um, who are Khoi and San communities who were stripped by the apartheid government of their identity and reclassified as colored. Um, identity in South Africa um, given our colonial and apartheid history, it's very complex and it's a very painful issue. And it's often made more difficult by ourselves sometimes as anthropologists and social scientists um, in the ways in which we debate around these issues because we disconnect from the realities on the ground, from the experiences that people have. Um, in this piece, Datum uh, Patlele effortlessly explores issues around um, um, he ex sorry, in this um, piece, he effortlessly explores issues while poking fun at the absurd apartheid system um, and its strategies to control racial fluidity and ambiguity by conducting things like pencil and comb tests on hair and a bunch of other unintellectual intelligence tests to categorize different racial groups. He does this while giving us a glimpse into the apartheid history, the social life, and while he also depicts characters' conversations and the ways in which they navigate life. Um, through this approach, he tackles very important theoretical um, information on race issues, on colorism, on our pluralistic identities, and many other issues. Um, another theorist that reminds us of the importance of doing this, on the importance of simplifying complex theoretical ideas so that they reach the masses, um, is Bell Hooks. Bell Hooks reminds us that this is important, particularly when discussing feminist discourse. She tells us that it's important for us to use everyday platforms and spaces of communication um, to, um, to relay important feminist theoretical um, knowledge. She discusses, um, sorry, she has this discussion in relation to the lack of accessibility of feminist thoughts and perspective. She explains that the lack of easy access to the discourse results in many feeling alienated by it, hating it, or sometimes misunderstanding its intentions. She argues and urges us to use feminist thought in, um, and ideas in unconventional ways. She says it should be in billboards, it should be on TVs, movies, adverts, um, buses, poems, and so on. Um, feminism should, be, um, should also go further in finding itself in unlikely spaces such as churches, schools, places of work, and even the family. Um, this is true even for Ndatam um, Patlele's um, 
discourse um, on race, on education, and politics. Um, much of his discourse and his life's work um, does what Bell Hooks urges us to do. Um, in, in our current state of enemy, it's very important for us as academics to also start to engage in this kind of discourse and this kind of engaged scholarship. It's our responsibility um, to um, start, especially as universities slowly start to lose their dominance in society. Um, this is partly due to rising unemployment, even amongst our graduates, um, where many have asked the question of the usefulness of receiving a qualification of higher education if they are unable to find jobs. Um, mounting socioeconomic issues, which have created a crisis um, and a deepening in poverty, disunity, loss, loss of ethics, and the enemy that is detailed in today's topic. All these issues have led many to question the role of the university. Um, offering solutions to these problems is something that we need to start to work together to do and start to put out these solutions in ways that are accessible in the ways that um, Tata Mpahlela um, put out his work. Um, so it becomes important for us as education and, and institutions of higher learning um, to start to find ways to make knowledge be more accessible, um, especially when it has the potential to save lives and to address some of these social ills, as well as to restore Africa's pluralistic identities and, um, um, and our roots. Um, Sorry, as an academic, as academics, we should learn from um, Datem Pahlela because um, he went beyond just being a writer and educator. He was engaged in activism. He worked in the media space. He ensured that his work had global reach, um, and he was a truly engaged scholar who was not just confined to the academic space. And because he defied all of these boundaries, um, his work and his teachings continue to live on long after his passing. Um, it's important for um, us to reflect and look at Mpahlele's life and work um, in reference to drawing from the state of um, enemy that we find ourselves in, um, the historical context that Prof. Uh, Olus, Olukoshi, Olukoshi, sorry, has detailed for us. Um, by looking at Ndatem Patlela's work, we can start to undo some of these, um, um, the, some of the state of enemy that we find ourselves in, and we can start to forge for ourselves an African identity that we can be proud of. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Shange, uh, for your very critical reflections and for challenging the university academic uh, institutions to really look at themselves and the role that they play in society and in how we can change the world through the kind of education that we offer and the importance of doing so really from a critical perspective. Uh, and so invoking the spirit of Eski Mpahlele to assist us to start thinking towards that direction was very important. Thank you so much. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to try again uh, and see if the second time around we're going to be lucky in managing to connect with Professor Sipamandla Zondi. That is Pamandla Zondi, apologies. Uh, that is Zondi, over to you. It looks like, yes, it looks like we're still having uh, audio challenges. We're going to try and see if we can uh, resolve that. And that is on the...
Ladies and gentlemen, I think in the interest of time, what I'm going to do is I'm now going to move over to the question and answer session. And while, when we're done with that, um, I'll then uh, offer Dede Zondi the opportunity to offer his remarks. So we're going to keep trying to find a way uh, to get his audio sorted because I believe that um, we would all love to hear the reflections that you would like to share with us. Uh, but I think in the interest of time, what we will do now uh, is to move over to the question and answer session and then we'll come back to Ndete Zondi. Um, and the first question that we have is from Ishmael Mkabela. And this question is directed to you, Professor Olukushi, and it's, it says your talk, Prof, is very profound and challenging. So the question is what next could orientate Africa and its leaders in further pursuing a renewed and unifying vision in Pan-Africanism? Are we hopelessly trapped in enemy? That is the question. Are we hopelessly trapped in enemy? And I think while the, the question is directed at Prof, I will also uh, offer an open invitation to our discussants as well, if they would like to also offer some inputs in terms of responding to the question. Um, I'll ask the second question and then give you the opportunity then to respond to the questions. The second question is from Kanya Ndabangulu. And Kanya is asking our panelists today, what role can Prof Mpasele's writings play in redefining ourselves and the quest for decolonizing contemporary Africa? So I'll give the opportunity to you, Professor Olokushi, to respond. Uh, thank you, thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, I think the two questions are interrelated and the important message which I would like to reiterate is that pessimism and defeatism was never really a part of the story of Eskia in Patlele. Um, and, and that's why in the, in the, in the talk, I, 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 I took the opportunity reading um, his biographical work um, and several interviews which he granted uh, in different fora to, to people who wanted to uh, dig a bit deeper into some of his experiences and the themes he explored in his writing. Uh, out of all of the tough experiences, he always insisted on resilience and strength, that inner strength and the resilience, which is a part of us uh, and which makes it possible for us, even in the face of crisis, of defeat, of despair, of pain, to rediscover ourselves um, in a way that ensures at the same time that we don't lose our humanity. Um, and it's important, I think, even as we self-introspect um, and do so in, in a very um, honest and hard way, and we need to be hard on ourselves um, for the fact that we underperform or we underperform our potentials um, repeatedly. But even as we do that, we shouldn't allow that to lead us to a situation of surrender, because that was really never part of uh, Eskia's um, way uh, of dealing with adversity uh, or challenges. Um, and important in all of this also, I found, was the emphasis, especially in several of the interviews he gave, uh, the emphasis which he played placed on connectedness with the land and the context as a means towards finding an authenticity that can enable us not only to ask the correct questions, 
know, it says you must be able in the context or the locale in which you find yourself, be able to feel it, to smell it, to taste it, uh, to be immersed into it in a way that effectively, I think many of us scholars have lost um, and which therefore makes us vulnerable to many of the interpretative uh, misrepresentations of our situation and of our continent that is so frequently um, present in what passes for African studies uh, in, in, in many places. Um, and that capacity, that ethnographic immersion, that insertion uh, in community, um, uh, is itself a source of strength and of, of empowerment. Um, because at the end of the day, it is precisely our capacity to be part of a community, um, whether in the straight sense of the word or even in terms of an epistemic community with which we engage, that we are able to find both relevance and meaning. Um, uh, and so, you know, when all is said and done, I think um, uh, uh, pessimism uh, and defeatism were really never uh, on the agenda uh, uh, for, for, for him. Um, what can we do with our leaders? I think, I think quite honestly, on, on both the side of the scholar and the side of the leaders, um, there is a lot of unlearning that we need to do. Um, historically, uh, and you know, people have documented this from Ali Mazri through to uh, Mahmoud Mamdani and the whole host of others. The relationship between the university, the African university, the post-colonial university and the state has always been a testy one. Um, uh, Kwame Nkrumah uh, was a key driver of the establishment of the University of Ghana at Legon. But the University of Ghana at Legon was also one of the sites of some of the worst hostility to Nkrumah. Um, and it took a very long time, actually, for anything to be named after Nkrumah on the campus of the University of Ghana at Legon, which he helped to found um, and to develop into um, uh, a major institution uh, beyond what the colonial authorities um, had put in place as a university college. Uh, and part of that hostility, I think, arises out of, or suspicion, arises out of, um, I would argue, uh, the absence of a recognition on the one hand by leadership that to speak truth to power is not necessarily to be in opposition, but also a recognition on the side of the scholar that to engage with power is not necessarily to be a sellout. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's two universes that really need to come together. And it actually should be a source of continuing worry to us, perhaps a bit less so in South Africa um, for very good historical reasons. But frequently observed in many other countries where those in power and authority are actually far more comfortable to engage with foreign experts than to engage with local expertise on which taxpayer resources have been spent in order to build up their knowledge and their capacity only for them to be ignored, excluded, marginalized on account of these suspicions uh, that I spoke about. And I think unless the philosophy of thought and the philosophy of action come together, united by a common vision of transformation, we may not actually be able to begin to build the kind of self-confidence, confident assertion that we require for forging ahead uh, on our terms and on the basis of our own uh, priorities. Um, uh, to this day, for too many countries, priorities are defined from outside the continent. 
and it is um, disheartening in many respects to find that initiatives which are cooked up in Washington or Paris or London um, and which may be suitable for one out of 55 countries on the continent begin to be replicated all over um, within a short period of time, propelled by donor power, but also underpinned by external ideas that do not have the kind of grounding and rootedness which was, which was so dear to uh, Eskia in terms of the way in which he constructed uh, the basis uh, for knowledge uh, and his understanding of what needed uh, to, uh, to be done in order for us to be effective change agents. So there is an unlearning to be done, uh, I think, on both sides uh, of the academy and of power um, to understand that we, in the end we are in the same boat, actually. And uh, dishonor which is visited on African leaders is also dishonor uh, for us uh, as academics. Uh, and we are not exempted from that uh, um, kind of dehumanization uh, that we see uh, visited uh, on too many of, our, of those who hold authority. I hope I addressed your concern. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Olukushi. And now I would like to look over to our discussants uh, for your brief remarks, specifically on the question, how can we redefine ourselves as we move towards uh, decolonial or decolonized ideals? So what is it that we need to do? What action has to be taken? How can we redefine ourselves? Uh, you can start, Prof. Kuno. Thanks. Um, I, I wanted to share a few thoughts on the first question. If, if okay, you please go me. ahead, then you can combine the Ye two. Yes. Um, earlier, uh, we were having a conversation with Professor Paswana, and she was speaking to how, you know, even in context where students, UNISA students and other universities in the, in the country, um, where even though they experience a lot of challenges, uh, and even though there might be uh, instances of hopelessness, uh, there are instances of agency where students uh, create opportunities for themselves, where um, in context where youth is engaging in, 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 in drugs, is engaging in uh, acts that might not be, you know, uh, healthy, or useful for their well-being and their ability to contribute in the future. You have mothers who stand up and fight. In context where uh, we are having challenges with electricity, we are seeing the re-emergence of community groups that are created to solve their own problems. And I think that is quite significant to observe, especially you know, thinking about how in my youth, for example, we had street committees where you know, those street committees created and provided solutions. So, so, so I just wanted to clear that, that even though there are challenges, even though we can speak of hopelessness, there are pockets of creativity and there are pockets of, of immense contribution that come from um, grandmothers, uh, that come from you know, those we assumed to be unemployed, who are actually hard workers. Many of the youth that we define as unemployed work harder than most of the people who are employed. But the challenge is that the work that they do is unable to feed them, is unable to contribute to their well-being and the well-being of their communities. And I think those questions and those observations are quite significant in thinking around you know, what it means to decolonize. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think it means we need to reimagine. We need to take back the power to define. You know, what do we mean by um, investment? Who must make the investment? What kind of an investment must be made? You know, and how, and I think also from, from uh, the works and the being of Ntatem Patele, I think it is quite fundamental. Again, I want to go back to the idea of being simple. You know, the, the idea of simplistic living, the idea of 
you know, the grand ideas that we have, sometimes they create problems for us because we stress, we, we are unable to make them work, you know, in, in many of the contexts where they are most needed. So the simplistic way of being, and, 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 and you spoke about also how he, he writes in a very accessible way, you know, in a simple way that everyone can understand. But what we do as universities, which, which I think is a challenge of, of the colonial history, is that we complicate things that don't need to be complicated. And feminist writers have taught this. They continually write about this, that it is the intention of power mm. to hide mm. information that can be useful. Mm. And I think from the works of Tatem Patlele, decolonizing means that let's, let's call there, there, you know, mm. and, and let's not go to the dictionary and try to find big scary ways. When, we, when the intention is to make our stories heard, the intention is to make our contribution useful. So decoloniality, in the sense of how I understand that Tempathele's contribution is to be simply simple, is to go back to the drawing board, is to go back to our communities, is to call that child that doesn't have shoes, you know? It's the everyday small things that we can do. And, and, and we, we need to move away from that, those grand ideas that we can build Rome in one day. It's build one brick at a time. And where you are. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Just the everydayness of it um, in, in the importance of always seeing hope in spaces where others often assume there's no hope and, and make assumptions about how communities function. And I think this is a good segue to you, uh, Ms. Shange, because you have been talking about the importance of centering our communities in the work that we're doing. So your responses. Um, I think my response is to think a lot about culture and how culture shapes us um, as individuals and helps us to find our sense of self, but also culture as an, as an important knowledge tool. I'm, I'm reminded even as Prof. Grace is talking about the issues around electricity and, you know, um, women in the Eastern Cape often resolve those challenges by using cultural knowledge that isn't seen to be as important, but um, has far greater um, what importance um, than our, you know, current um, system of providing electricity. It's more sustainable than even renewables that are often um, encouraged, which again, it's, it's uh, with the renewables as important as they are, it's external um, ideas and views being imposed on us. And when you look at um, very simplistic, um, and again, this I think links back to uh, that uh, notion of simplicity, um, the very simplistic way in which women in the Eastern Cape and in different rural communities resolve this issue by um, creating gas from waste, by creating gas from um, animal waste, from food waste. Um, I think these are the ways that we start to slowly chip away at um, some of the colonial shackles that still bring us down and start to um, reimagine and redefine ourselves in, in decolonized ways. We, we start to take those knowledge systems and view them as more than just cultural things that belong in Makaya, but um, for them to be important uh, knowledge system that can compete even with um, solar power energy, that can compete with um, whatever Western um, technological advances and solutions. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, I have been informed that we have found a way to connect Professor Supermantla Zondi, Ndate Zondi, and so I'm going to go for the third time lucky and ask that we now move over to Ndate Zondi. Uh, thank you very much, and I apologize for the witchcraft that we suffered. I hope I can be heard now. Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you that is on yes. your head. Thank, thank you very much. Um, um, I, I was just going to make a few points. Uh, it, it, I, I, the, the most critical one is where Professor Adebajo ended. So I'd like to greet all of you and all protocols of Zev and apologize uh, for the manner in which I walk in. Uh, where he ends when he recap for us what um, 
Professor Mpatele said uh, about us thinking from a place and thinking in relation to a place, because in African Dawn, he also talks about uh, dealing with the tyranny of a place and a time, and that all of our lives revolve about around how we relate to the time and and the place. This places um, uh, uh, in the long tradition of African uh, thinking, especially radical thinking. Um, just as uh, 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 Bio so eloquently uh, told us through the importance of the history and the passage of time coming to now in relation to political and economic events, there is also a, a passage of time and event in relation to intellectual efforts, the attempts to make sense of it. We, we are in this meeting to try and make sense of the time and place where we are. From the modernizing optimists uh, of the of the early 20th century and going back to the 19th century, Abu Mkai and the, re and the rest of them, uh, Abu Adi Ajayi, uh, Priscilla Gasseme, uh, Tuku, and the rest of them, who who hung their hope on the possibility that may perhaps we have to survive uh, the relationship with this new behemoth, this new animal, this new monster that has come to our shore is to relate with it and influence it for your good. It did not work. Then we have the, 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 the critical modernists who still believe in modernism, modernism, but we're using it to fight the system. That's the generation of Edward Blyde and of, of, uh, of, of Albert Lichuli and, and the rest of them who, who thought that we could chisel away, that we could use modernism against itself. To the, to, the, to the traditions that, uh, that emerge uh, out of that and after that uh, of radicals of various form uh, who believed in returning to the source as, as Amirka Cabral would call it, uh, who believed in finding their roots again uh, as the Negritude movement would, would talk about it, who believe in finding who they were as, uh, as Marcus Gavi uh, would, call, would, would call it. Uh, they uh, range all the way from the ones I've mentioned to Wallace Oyinka, to Achima Feche, to Bless Diane, to Ifi Amadiume, uh, to, to Achebe, to Umpasel. Those who found, who sought to find what is an African way to respond to this problem that we are facing, uh, to this enemy that we are facing, to the new radicals that are emerging now uh, around the the idea of second decolonization. Given that point then, um, it is very clear from what Bio was, was, was telling us that uh, there are certain lessons to learn for this new generation that are decolonizing, talking about decolonizing right now. One of it is the point that is made so eloquently by Eskian Patele, that in order to decolonize, we must first overcome the first exile. We were first exiled at encounter. That's the idea that our contact with colonialism exiled us from ourselves. We were exiled from our roots, from our poetry, from our rhythm, from our music, from our drama, uh, from our way of thinking, our worldview, to our spirituality. We were exiled from all of this. What in Guki calls we were dismembered. That when the head of Hinsa or Ota Benga in the DRC were cut off at a point of conquest. The, the purpose was to separate the body of an African from his mind. So his mind would sit in a museum in London while his body would lie in a tomb in Africa, which was signaling that they would live in Africa but think from Europe. That there was a dismemberment that happened. And for Eskian Patele, that dismemberment must be undone. Secondly, that encounter also produced a... A, a new striving, what they call a spiritual striving of an African and a black person, which is similar to the point made by W. D. Bois about the fact that our basic uh, spiritual striving is to unite the two con con uh, conscious consciousnesses that we have acquired. That on one side we are black, on the other side we, we are kind of mahua at the same time. We have both ways, we are modern and we are traditional, and we move between that on the 24th of September, we go back to ourselves 
after the 24th of September, we go back to our new self. So we are cut between, and 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 um, as Campachella called it, hybridity. That is the post-colonial hybridity that we feel we, we, we are facing is the fact we are human beings with two souls, and these two souls are always striving for something, and they need to find unity. Uh, what what the ability was called. The, 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 this unity of the W consciousness. H I E Zomo called this being neither nor. That, that's the problem we're facing for him. That's the alienation we must reverse before we can even fix a curriculum or fix a building, fix anything. Because a bewitched person, I come from a rural area, a bewitched person cannot be trusted to help cleanse a community. They need to be first cleanse themselves detoxify themselves because they can be trusted to do this. And that this requires that unending uh, dialogue of the conscience, consciences, uh, which, 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 which produces what, uh, what um, 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 uh, uh, Eskian Patele called ambivalence, that we live in ambivalence. We, we are in two worlds, uh, what Shula Marx called ambiguities of existence, that we as educate, so-called educated black uh, people, we exist in two worlds at the same time, and that creates confusion because it's divisions of souls that we have to contend with all the time. Therefore, he suggests to us that in order to respond to the problems of our time, be it poverty, be it gender, be it violence, be it this alienation, this, is, this um, distance from uh, uh, our communities, be it all the problems, the policies that don't work, we need to deal with that uh, spiritual striving. He says um, there were those who tried to do it by draining to Western modernity and assimilate, uh, but that produced what Hamid Okane calls ambiguous adventure. You, you adventured into ambiguity and you tore, you, you tore yourself asunder. So you did a second exile, which is the dismemberment again of a person who has been dismembered, dismembered again to further complicate the thing. And therefore, the, uh, for them, it's very critical for us to think about the, the, this place and the experiences that produce us so that we are able to not repeat the mistakes of the Nkrumas of this world, of the Nyereres, uh, of, the, uh, of the latter side, the the, the Mbegi generation and the Obasanjo generation, we need to overcome that dismemberment, that first exile, and return to the source, to ourselves, if we are going to be able to overcome the problems of our time. Lastly, I want to just make the point that he argues, therefore, that we're going to need what he himself calls intellectual and artistic hybridity. Except, sort of dexterity, that ability to work with great ingenuity uh, in this environment to create a new environment. Otherwise, we'll be stuck in this environment, calling out for the future that we desire, decolonial future, decolonial future, but calling out it out within this entrapment, which is produced by the first exile and the second exile that we are living with. Uh, which is why Carter G. Watson says, that the, uh, the educated Negro is the biggest danger to his community uh, because the, ed, his education has taught him his place in the world, which is not his original place. He says that he taught him that he's, he needs to enter the room from, from the back. And if he doesn't find an entrance from the back, he will drill one for himself because his education makes it necessary for him to find his place. Which is why then Eskian Prashara talks about finding this new humanism, finding this new way uh, by which we, we could live, the poetry of truth that we need to find, that new rhythm that comes up as the poets were saying, uh, which helps us to become authentically human. For he says to be human is also an affirmation that I am because we are, we are because you are. It is about a process of mutual recognition that should first happen within us, between the souls we have, and, and also between us and others. So I think there is a lot to be learned here that we could apply 
in order to better guide the processes that we are doing, uh, we are undertaking right now as we try to imagine a new and an African university uh, to reimagine the, the, the way of thinking, to rethink, to relearn, as Odora Hoppers talk, so, uh, calls it. But we can't do it if we ourselves are bewitched by that which we are trying to solve. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you will agree with me that indeed Prof Ndade Zondi was worth the wait. We struggled, uh, but eventually we managed to connect with him and boy was it worth it. Rale Boha Ndade Zondi, we were exiled from ourselves, from who we once were. And your call for us to detoxify ourselves, to get involved in the detoxification project, and that we need to also be involved in the project of rememberment, remembering who we once were, is very, very important. And I think in many ways it also responds to the question that was asked earlier. How can we redefine ourselves? It's important for us to venture into this project of rememberment, remembering who we once were so that we can be able to move forward as a people. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I have a few comments that I would like to read out from uh, people who have been listening to the lecture. And we have Chweni Muila, who says that, I think the attitude of the youth to disengage was created by the government's failure to honor its promises towards the youth. There is no positive action on the country's leaders to invest trust in the youth and empower them to be the future leaders. So I think really that is a call uh, for us to, to really pause about the importance of thinking about the role that the government plays and the role that we can all play as, as we reimagine, as we continue on this project of reimagining and moving forward. And another comment from Meto Kodidiza, who is thanking Professor Olukushi for an illuminating lecture. She responds to the call from Professor, Professor Olukushi and says, we take heed of the advice on what we individually and collectively can do to reclaim our continent. And I have one more question, a burning question from Mantlokwani Yanle Sudi. And the question is directed to you, Professor Olukushi, that since capitalism has brought misery to Africa, is it not time that the AU starts speaking socialism and the teachings of Karl Marx and Lenin for the realization of the true Africa, free from imperialism and colonialism. Professor Olukushi. Oh, before you respond, Prof, there's a, one more question uh, from Mahatla Tipa. Mahatla is saying, as a community activist in the literary space working with children, we hosted Eski and Patlele Centenary celebration in 2019. What was the shocking, or what was shocking, was all the children in the library not knowing who Eskiam Pasele was and his role in South African literature. I can relate as someone who grew up mm -hmm. in the late 90s, uh, or rather early 90s, um, and at school not having any books at all that were prescribed um, that focused on African literature. It's very sad that I was only introduced to African literature when I got to the university. And we know that this was a deliberate effort. But that in 2019, many children still don't know who Eskiam Pasele is, is really uh, troubling and something for us to really take seriously as we think about the project of decolonization and Africanization. And so Mahatla continues, I therefore ask, what role can academics play in ensuring that the work of Eski and Pasele is known in communities and schools, and in particular in rural areas. 
And I think uh, here we can have comments from all the discussants. Uh, just very briefly, uh, please. And um, I think I'm going to stop here with the questions, uh, just in the interest of time. So I'm going to hand over to first to Professor Olukushi to respond. And then I'm going to hand over to our three discussants. And I'm going to ask that as you respond, you also then just offer your concluding remarks as well. Thank you. Professor Olukushi, over to you. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, <clears throat> MacArthur's uh, observation and question, I think um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a very important one. Um, and and uh, I mean, in this specific instance, uh, talking about uh, SK, but we can extend this to many others uh, who have made landmark contributions uh, to scholarship and to knowledge, uh, but are unsung and uncelebrated. Um, sometimes uh, to be contrasted with people um, who have made lesser contributions, but uh, for whom, for many reasons, um, we find that we have to engage uh, with them in, in, the, in the curriculum. Um, one message which I would like to, to share um, uh, in the first instance is that as important as keeping um, knowledge and awareness of the contribution of healthcare and life in South Africa is also the task of ensuring that we keep that knowledge and awareness alive on a pan-African scale. Because let's not forget also that, um, and this is reflected in his writings, that um, uh, SK was, was, was very much immersed in, 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 in the context and environments outside of South Africa in which he found himself during the exile years. At least two of his publications were on his experiences in Nigeria, um, uh, in the slum of Bariga uh, and the ballad uh, for, the, for Oyo. Um, that he composed. And I think it, it is a certain sense in which as much as it is important um, and, and that job must be done and, and I hope UNISA and others will uh, invest continuously uh, in the endeavor of keeping this uh, memory and contribution alive in South Africa. Um, I hope that outreach will also be made, uh, certainly an outreach between UNISA and the University of Ibadan, for example, uh, where SKR was, was, was active, uh, would be made uh, in order to ensure also uh, that some kind of memorialization uh, that can uh, at least match uh, what we are celebrating today uh, is, is put in place uh, in, in those contexts. Um, I, will not, I will not speak about Pennsylvania, but I'm more concerned particularly of the Pan-African context, considering what uh, he meant for us and his feeling anyway, that uh, not fully understanding American culture and not getting the kind of education uh, that he thought he would uh, be able to find from his American peers about what exactly constituted American culture uh, played an important part in his decision to return to the continent uh, and to South Africa, uh, to a context uh, and the community whose cultures, including um, its spiritual underpinnings, uh, he felt he fully understood and out of which he could make meaning and find uh, relevance uh, as a change agent. Now, um, uh, the, 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 the task of uh, popularizing the likes of, uh, of, of Eskia is one which I think uh, needs to be played out at different levels. Um, uh, perhaps uh, through uh, investments in the, in the production of uh, short, uh, readable and accessible um, uh, stories about the thinking and the lives and the life of Eskia. Um, some of the things which, which I've, I've seen on visits to South Africa of quotable quotes and reflections um, by the Eskia Center of Memory um, uh, such productions, I think, can be 
deliberately um, uh, promoted, uh, targeted at different levels of our educational system and made accessible uh, to, 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 to our children from an early age uh, right up to the university level. We are much more uh, serious engagements uh, about, about his life and his times and his contribution uh, could form part of uh, proper academic uh, re-readings uh, of, 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 of his contribution, of his works. Um, so I'm looking at a situation, for example, of the kinds we were exposed to as, as students of popular readers um, about the thinking of Lenin or Karl Marx or the thinking of Adam Smith or David Ricardo, um, short pamphlet type uh, popular readings that a secondary school uh, 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 kid can pick up uh, 15, 20 pages summarizing uh, and if curious enough, uh, can then feel incited to, to dig deeper in order to understand uh, the person uh, we, are, we are talking about. So popular readers, which can also be available in local languages, um, uh, easy to translate for the shortness um, of, 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 um, of, 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 their, of their content and the simple way in which they are also uh, conveyed to um, that, that particular public that is targeted. Um, nowadays, there are multimedia uh, resources that we can also uh, invest in in order to ensure that uh, some of the more popular aspects uh, of, of his thinking that are integral to our quest to rediscover ourselves as a people um, can be uh, properly uh, 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 realized. Um, the African Union to talk socialism. Well, that will be the day. That will be the day. Um, <laughs> my, my, my plea, and I would, I would join Eskia in this, my plea is not really for us to be too uh, hung up about um, uh, uh, a tension between capitalism and socialism, uh, but rather um, in line with Eskia, to find a way of creating a new humanism, which in many respects still comes a bit more naturally to us on the African continent uh, than in other parts of the world. And some have derided what Eskia celebrated as that humanistic instinct. Some have derided it in the academic literature as amounting to not, not, not anything more than a political economy of affection. Um, as Joran, Joran Huden was to describe it, that keeps Africa underdeveloped. Um, we are not commodifying things enough. We are not um, uh, charging um, uh, market uh, value and, and prices for things which we give. We tend to be too altruistic and all of that. Um, a basic foundation of humanism um, uh, to which Eskia was very much attached and which I think can form the basis for a reimagining of the way in which we order economy and society uh, on, on our continent. Uh, it will require a lot of boldness um, and it will require um, a considerable amount of audacity um, in a context in which there are powerful interests that are united uh, behind the so-called capitalist and the so-called socialist. Um, but in all of this, uh, I, would, I, would, I would really not um, uh, wave the flag of either of them, uh, neither of socialism, because at the end of the day, uh, these, are, these are frames of reference um, which may be useful for um, ideological purposes of positioning and posturing, but in the real practice of things uh, are a bit more uh, mixed uh, and diluted uh, than we are often made, are made to believe. Um, uh, Sweden is capitalist, uh, but underpinned by a social democracy. But even in the United Kingdom that will pride itself, uh, especially during the Thatcher years, of being at the forefront of a pure market agenda uh, on a global scale, uh, the public sector contribution to the GDP uh, of the UK during the Thatcher years was well over 30%. Uh, 
uh, underscoring the important role of the public sector and of the state in the making of the economy uh, of that country. Um, uh, and so, you know, systems are a bit more to, 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 to use the word that uh, Spamandla uh, cited earlier on. Uh, systems are a bit more hybrid, um, but the underlying philosophy that drives them is something which I hope uh, we can invent for ourselves and bequeath to the world as our contribution uh, to uh, the global uh, place of ideas and policy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Olukushi. And now I'm going to hand over to Ms. Shange for your thoughts and concluding remarks, please. Um, thank you. Um, I, th I think I'm going to mimic a lot of um, Prof. Olukushi's uh, remarks, especially on the issue of um, should we not move more towards socialism. I think while socialism is arguably a, a better system than, than, than capitalism, which has um, been responsible so, for so much of the violence and atrocities and um, genocide and land grab and conquest that we've seen in Africa, um, my, my issue or my problem with socialism is that even when we look to socialism as an alternative or as solutions, um, it's that we're still determining social life around um, economies. And I think we need to move beyond that mentality because when we do that, we disempower ourselves. Um, I think when we revolve a lot of social life around economies, um, it, we put ourselves as secondary because these systems put money, labor, and commodities ahead of people, well-being, and livelihood. Um, I think those are also my closing remarks. Thank, Thank you. you so much, uh, Professor Kuno. Um, I, 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 I just want to answer the question around what can academics do. I think, I think the finger should be pointed to all of us. Um, I think that um, some of the best contributions come from communities engaging with whatever significant resources uh, are around them. And I'm thinking that the, the, the person who asked the question, uh, this is the question he must answer. What can he do? Um, you know, when I was growing up, I, I remember we had community theater where, you know, community leaders, community teachers would gather children around and get them to read or to perform a particular book. And, and that is what we need to draw from. Uh, we can't have uh, the works and the memory of Ntatem Patlele sit in a library in a big university. It needs to go to the community. And the only way for it to go to the community is if the communities appropriate it as, as theirs. So I want to conclude there that it is not the academic's responsibility. Expect making creates challenges because we tend to uh, create boundaries where we need to create flow. So let's, let's do the job, all of us. Let's think together. Whether you're an academic or not, let's te teach together. Uh, let's 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 take responsibility together. Thank yeah, you so much, Prof. Kuno. I, I'm listening to you, and all I'm hearing is exactly because the question is always: we speak about decolonization, uh, and mostly in theory. So, how do we put that into practice? And I think what the example that you've just given right now is exactly that: how we can rethink how we even teach as well. So, if we're talking about African literature, if we're talking about what Prof. Olukushi said in terms of teaching in a way that makes learning accessible, the idea that that you've just spoken about of, of uh, community theater and how that can come into the classroom in ways in which teaching can happen is for me part of the decolonizing agenda and, and really re uh, thinking and dismantling uh, the classroom space and how it currently looks like. So thank you very much for that, Prof. And now to you, Ndade Zondi, your final thoughts and concluding remarks, please. 
Uh, uh, presented to us uh, in, the, in the lecture and again in the comments, underlined for us that it is important to understand Eskia in the tradition that he belongs to, not as a single individual who must just be celebrated alone, because he no, never saw himself as a lone figure. He saw himself as part of that huge tradition with echoes of Senghor, of James Baldwin, of Del Pacin, of Percy Head, or of Nabot Mukhate, and, and many others. It's important to locate the uh, black uh, red in traditions and in history. The second thing is that thought and action are important. There are responsibilities for academics, uh, which is to think part of it, but also to, to engage in some action uh, to do that. But they should not neglect to think, because thinking is also important in order to undo the, the first and second exile. We have a duty to help others at least become aware that there is a problem, at least uh, to reveal to people their, the problem that they face. It's, it's an important one. With regards to the, to the socialism issue, uh, my response to it would be to say, what do these traditions of intellectuals tell us? All of them, by the way, borrowed from something. The first generation borrowed from modernism. The second generation borrowed from Marxism. The current generation borrows also from everywhere. We, we should not be opposed to borrowing, but we must borrow on the basis of what we need and leave out what we don't need, because we must avoid fundamentalism, where you say you don't take ideas from Marxism because Marxism is Western or socialism because it is narrow. No, it is dangerous. <laughs> Prof Zundi, we seem to have lost audio again. Prof? Yes. Yes, I think I maybe, yes. Um, you can just con uh, continue from where you stopped. We lost you for a moment there. We lost audio. OK, no, thanks. I had already said just before that we need to be not afraid to borrow. Because all the, including Eskia himself, he, he says he's a product of the places he was. Where were the places he was? He was in the US twice. He was in France. And he was in various African countries. He borrowed from all of those. It's important for us to get the best we can get from anywhere without losing our basis uh, of, of, of action and thought. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to our keynote speaker and our discussants. Uh, and now, as we move towards concluding our proceedings for tonight, we started by inviting Ms. Tsokofatso Monama to assist us to open. And now I would like to invite her again to assist us to close also. So I would like to give this moment to Ms. Monama to again give us another poem. Thank you. My black ballpoint pen writes. It writes in the tongue I do not dream in. It spits words my forefathers have been beaten in. My black ballpoint pen writes clearly, visibly, scribing incongruencies, fallacies, indiscrepancies of what it truly means to hold a black ballpoint pen in Africa. Africa, my beautiful continent, a place where content is not content, a place where Chimamande Ngozi Adichie addresses why literature written in Africa cannot be accepted as just literature, but must be called African literature. A place where Ngozi Adichie addresses the constant labeling of our knowledge creation as a way of disabling the content creators. A place where Gopano Radele addresses Africanism as a point of discrimination. A place where my black ballpoint pen writes 
contentiously. A place where my black ballpoint pen writes pretentiously. Have I been given this black ballpoint pen to write or just rewrite? Stories from past glories written in Eurocentric ink. Paragraphs that I need not think. Emulating Paulo Freire's banking model of education that treats my black ballpoint pen as an empty vessel. Nothing but a plastic container filled with ink that needs to reference the father. For without the latter, I am the other. One whose knowledge and contribution does not stand a chance for distribution. Is it because my black ballpoint pen is primitive? Is it because my black ballpoint pen lacks that extra gel feature to make it distinctive? But still, my black ballpoint pen writes words and pedagogies that do not assimilate. But still, my black ballpoint pen writes words and pedagogies that do not accumulate. My African intellect, my intellectual dialect, my black ballpoint pen writes effortlessly, my black ballpoint pen writes seamlessly, documenting Dinonwani Jabo Maholo, Kelengeda, a new story is written, Kelengeda, a story unfolding in time of a black ballpoint pen that activates as mine, of a black ballpoint pen that cultivates minds, of a black ballpoint pen that perpetuates a reclaiming of Africa's intellectual futures, a reclaiming of Africa's intellectual futures, a reclaiming of Africa's intellectual futures os pros ya pela intu hu what a way to bring us towards the conclusion of our proceedings today hu i sigh and now, ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor to invite Professor Stuart Mutata, the Registrar of UNISA, to come and offer the vote of thanks. Thank you, Program Director. Um, and I want to echo your words. Uh, what a wonderful, uh, and a very wonderful way to conclude uh, a very good and a very eventful week um, in the history of the University of South Africa. And Program Director, Professor Pulen Sehalo, allow me to prefix my vote of thanks by invoking the spirit of the giant Eskiam Pachele, a distinguished son of the soil, a great intellectual and consummate activist, a prolific scholar, an African humanist, a philosopher, an essayist, a novelist, simply a great writer who was even nominated for the Nobel Prize in Literature. And years after his passing, his memory continues to live strong and we continue to walk down Second Avenue, following his insights and genius. And to us, he lives. We thank his family for allowing us to continue to bask under the memory of his great name and shining light. We can only marvel at the energy 
the commitment and inspiration of our principal and vice chancellor, Professor Pudia Lingabula. Last night, on, on the occasion of her inauguration and investiture, she was on the stage sharing her very clear vision for the university's future and its mandate. Early this morning, she was on the podium, ably leading the colloquium on reclaiming Africa's intellectual futures. She continued to lead from the front this evening as well by introducing a guest speaker and further sharing her perspectives as she did so. All this while staring a mega university of some 380,000 students. And congratulations again, um, Madam VC. My deepest thanks to, um, to our guest, a special guest, Professor Adibayo Olukushi, who, despite his busy schedule, has honored us by finding time not only to grace this occasion, but also to share deep insights with us this evening. Professor Olukushi reminded us of the giants of Africa who championed African independence this evening. And he still, and I want to emphasize what he said, priorities are defined outside the continent, even after independence. And only from the mouth of a seasoned scholar could such pearls of wisdom, deep and landmark in defining insights and revelations flow so eloquently as they did tonight. I'm sure that every single one of us gathered here tonight has picked up invaluable eye-opening and mind-jogging pointers that will boast our own confidence in various intellectual, academic, and creative efforts into the future. Professor Moloko support the Regional Director, Northeastern Region, which spans the Mpumalanga and Limpopo provinces, continues to energize the annual Eskia Mpakele, annual, sorry, Eskia Mpakele Memorial Lecture, including this 12th edition of its rendition. The region has successfully presented these lectures and secured their place in the university, provincial and national calendars for all these years because of its leadership and the superb team of men and women in this region. No excuses were offered even during the current COVID-19 pandemic, and the pace has been flawless. For this, we are extremely grateful, Professor. Thank you for very much for tonight's discussions. <coughs> Our own Professor Grace Kuno as well as um, esteemed friends, Professor Sipamanda Zondi, and Ms. Nompuni Melele from the University of Johannesburg and the University of the Free State, respectively. You have, where we may have fallen short, enabled us to understand every, even better what the guest speaker has presented in raising questions that may need to be reflected upon in a highly professional but critical manner, and also in stimulating the discussions that follow. We have been joyfully entertained, <coughs> but also our minds have been powerfully challenged by the poems that were rendered this evening by Ms. Munama, Le Memunama, the principal, Realevoch. Your contribution to this evening is acknowledged and applauded. Applauded, like a beacon, Eskia Mpakele. Continue to write, continue to recite, continue to provoke, to invoke, to challenge, to impact, and may your creativity be recognized far and wide. You, the audience, are a critical element of this memorial lecture, and have been so over the years. We thank you for making the time to join us this evening, for supporting this lecture, and for participating in it. Remember, more in, in is the making, and we will, more is in the making, and we will 
be excited to see you again um, in the future. And as for you, program director, you have done an outstanding job, uh, Professor. You have set the mood, made everyone feel welcome, relaxed, but focused and connected. And your ambience was simply what master, what master classes are all about. And thank you very much. And finally, let me thank you for, for remaining, all of us as a, as a nation, for remaining vigilant during this pandemic. Let me thank those you know, who went for vaccinations. Let me thank those who are wearing masks diligently for washing your hands, social distancing, and sanitizing. And also, please, let's ensure that we respect the curfew hours and keep well, drive uh, safe, and keep safe. Thank you very much, Program Director. Thank you. And I would like to thank you, Professor Motata, as well, um, for also gracing this occasion tonight. Banabeso Nakila Moradi Waba Twining Sitloholo Sabatawung Kire Rafael Lamona. Until we meet again for the 13th annual memorial lecture in 2022, please stay safe so that we can see each other again in 2022. Hi, baby rock.